Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. I'm just going to hand you over to Kurt Anderson. Fantastic, thank you very much. Everybody looking forward to doing this webinar with you today, talking about uh, how we help organizations move from Excel chaos into integrated planning. Um, and the, the, the key word that we use on this is to plan confidently. Uh, and it's something that we've been using because you really need to have that confidence in the planning forecasting exercises that you're doing to know that you stand behind this process. So in the webinar today, that is exactly what we are going to be speaking on. Quickly, just a little bit of housekeeping. Everybody will be muted, I think for some obvious reasons, uh, during this webinar. You have the opportunity and we highly encourage you to be asking questions. You should see the uh, question box within the GoToWebinar meeting. And yeah, you should be able to do that. I, I do see one quick question that came in already saying that somebody cannot hear anything. I assume, uh, Colm, if you can't hear me, you will let me know. So, uh, but all of the questions, so to the person who cannot hear, you're gonna have to check your speaker settings. Uh, and for we will try to get through the questions depending on how many there are. The ones that we don't get through, we will take care of uh, and follow up on after the webinar. So. Do a quick introduction of the agenda for what we have today. Um, and before I do that, so a lot of the SEMA events that we have sponsored have been really around thought leadership. So not, not talking about product at all, not, not showing any product. And a lot of people appreciate that because it is bringing in thought leadership. People have also said, well, we understand those points, but can you show us something? Can you show us what this means? So for this webinar today, we are going to take a little bit of a different slant on it. Yes, we will be talking about uh, thought leadership, giving you some ideas, but we want to actually show you concrete examples of how you can quickly move from Excel-based uh, uh, budgeting and planning solutions into a enterprise performance management application. And we're going to show that to you live today, um, obviously on the basis of the Jedox software and the approach that we use with that. And the speakers today, so myself, Kurt Anderson, I am located out of Dusseldorf, Germany. I'm responsible for uh, the Nordics, UK and Benelux regions. I've been in this market, um, I started at the end of 1996 doing OLAP. So at the time they call it a DSS, Decision Support Systems, and then it was called MIS. But basically it's the exact same thing that um, we do now. Technology has just obviously advanced quite a bit. And with me today uh, is my colleague, Colum, uh, who has been also, uh, I believe equally as long as I have in, in, in this business. So if you put both of us together, I think we probably have about 50 years between us between uh, in this market. So uh, Colin will introduce himself uh, shortly when he starts his uh, presentation. I'm not gonna say really much about Jetbox. We are a global company, 2,500 customers, some very in interesting brands that we have, um, but you will be able to see that on the webpage. What we really wanna focus on today is to show you the product. In order to get to the product, I wanna just position something. And we're going to do a poll at the end of my PowerPoint, because we wanna see where it is in this group of people, how, where, where you are with your, it will say on your Excel journey. So together with um, ACCA, we did a poll, and this was about a year, year and a half ago, where we had asked companies, where are you on your performance management journey? Are you still heavily reliant on Excel for doing your budgeting forecasting pur purposes? And interesting, this was actually post uh, the start of COVID. So the COVID crisis, because if you think back um, in, in 2019, everybody had prepared their budget thinking, okay, the world's going to continue much as it has uh, the last year let's add 5% on top of our revenue and 3% on top of our costs. And more or less, this is where you know, we predict to land. 
And then February, March 2020 happened and everybody had to, you know, <laughs> re-budget uh, within a period of uh, weeks or a month. So in the study, 80% were still heavily reliant on Excel for all their budgeting, planning, forecasting. When we keep going on into that, now that's where really the problems start. Once, once an organization grows to a certain size and you have 50 or 100 users and each spreadsheet has uh, 10 tabs in it, I mean, doing the multiplication, obviously the, uh, it grows exponentially the number of spreadsheets that you're using. And with that also the inherent risks that come with it. And I was interviewing, um, just quick side note, I was interviewing a person for a job uh, on our team and he studied computer sciences, the science. And his, his point was in computer science, a system needs to fulfill three points. It needs to be efficient, it needs to be reliable and it needs to be secure. And he said, and that is exactly where I see the EPM industry right now, because people are, they're, they're basing their, their systems on an inefficient product that isn't reliable and it definitely is not secure. So that's why he, he really wanted to get into the EPM market, which I found a very interesting way from a, somebody from, with a computer science background. So, but if you think that, you know, one out of three has over 10,000 spreadsheets, how is that efficient, reliable or secure? So. Going on, the reason in the beginning why I told you that I've been, how long I've been in this business is because what I'm gonna show you, completely hand on my heart truthful, I showed this in 1998. And you will be able to see, because when you look at the comic, you'll see what type of a, a screen there is and with the filing cabinet. And yeah, because it was, it's a bit old, it, the resolution's not that great. What has changed? How many organizations 20 plus years on are still doing the same thing? So that is where for me, it's like, why are we not moving forward more you know, with these companies? Now, obviously some companies really have, they've made the investment um, and they're getting the returns from it. Kudos, congratulations, because you're seeing the efficiencies that come with it. So the other ones, that's what we're gonna talk about is that how can we get those efficiencies? The risks you know, that I talked about earlier with the three elements, you know, we have the, the risks that go along with having an Excel-based EPM platform. And I'm not gonna read the slide for you. Yeah? If, if I were to compare the same thing what companies do with Excel with other systems, could you build a CRM system using Excel? The answer is yes, you could. And a lot of small businesses started off that way. Could you build a system to do your general ledger in Excel? Yes, you could. Could you build an invoicing system in Excel? Yes, you could. Would any company do that today? No, because there's standard systems out there that are secure, reliable, and efficient. So why would you do that in Excel? The one area though, across corporate functions where Excel is still predominant is in the area of financial planning and, and, and analysis. And I don't think any company has ever made a strategic decision that, hey, we're going to stay with Excel for this because it's so efficient. It's just so good and it works so well with us, for us. So, so why would we want to continue this way, knowing those risks? And again, a lot of it is because companies, they say, well, we got through it, we'll deal with it next year. And then next year comes and it's the same, same point. When you look at the planning process and the complexity of the planning process, and I don't think anybody would disagree that the planning process has only become more complicated and accelerated in the last two and a half years than any time in, you know, we'll say in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, even when we think we're, we're getting over the, the, the hill with Corona, <clears throat> you know, then on February 24th, war breaks out. Now what's that going to mean? I mean, think about for the logistic companies right now that are paying diesel prices that are 50% higher than they were a month ago. Is that going to have an impact on bottom lines? Absolutely it will. Well, um, 
Now, do you think that uh, airlines that are flying between Europe and uh, Asia are going to cope when they're shut out of Russian airspace? No. So, <coughs> excuse me. So when you have to do rapid forecasting, do you want to be doing that on Excel to where you're loading the data, distributing it, entry date, collecting, monitoring, and you have all of these steps where it can break at any point, or you have a centralized database upon which you're doing then the planning. And that is what we're gonna to show today on how you can build exactly that. <coughs> Excuse me. This is my last slide and I'm gonna hand over to Colm. What I wanna show with this is that when, when you know, what is, a, what is the way that you go about climbing a mountain? You take your first step. And that's exactly the same way how the digital transformation works with EPM is that you need to take your first step. You're not going to get to the end result within the first three months. You know, where you want to be. So it is a process, and that is exactly what you see here. So first, we start with, start with the automation. Let's get the spreadsheet chaos under control. Work on a centralized system. Step two, let's look at how we can do integrated business planning. How can we really roll this out throughout the FP&A community? And even uh, what is now the new term that you're going to be hearing is XP&A, extended planning and analytics, to where we are eliminating silos within the organizations so that we are working together on a common platform, which is at the end of the day, the purpose of budgeting and forecasting. And then the last step, step is where you know, it gets exciting and a lot of magic happens, is when you have that solid foundation, then you can start to transform your business because you're able to leverage things like machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, and, and we have case studies where customers are already on that process and are getting into the transformative stage with their applications. And that is where a lot of the incredible value will come. So with that, I, we're going to go to the demo, but can we do the poll please? Because out of this group here, and we'll, we'll share the results, uh, we wanna see out of the group that is attending, how many of you are reliant on Excel for your FP&A um, processes? So let me... So I've just launched the poll question. So we'll give you another 15, 20 seconds or so to fill that out. Is it possible that I do not see the poll questions? I just have a screen. Yeah, it, it might be cut that you can't see it, but as soon as everyone's filled out the poll, I'll read the results to you. Okay, I'm just gonna so in that, um, what we want to do is just ask, how reliant is your organization today on Excel? Totally heavily reliant, or you got this sorted and you, you have a system in place to where you're, you're not living in the Excel chaos, but you have a professional system for your FPNA, just as you would have a professional system for your CRM system. Great, thank you everyone for participating. So I'm just gonna close the poll question and share the results. So we've got 40% of people on the webinar saying they're completely reliant on Excel. And then 48% are saying highly, 11% somewhat, and then just 1% saying we've got it sorted. Wow, interesting numbers. Interesting numbers for sure. So what we're going to do, Colin, you want to join? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm gonna. There you are. Uh, do you find those numbers uh, surprising? I, I actually thought it would have been a little bit more on the 10, 20 percent would have had got it sorted. So actually, that yeah, that was a bit surprising for me. It was. I, I expected that to be about 10 or more, but yeah, so one percent was. Yeah, that's very low. Okay. 
Colm, you should now be the presenter. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Just a quick check that uh, you can see my screen now. Yes, I do. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the event. Uh, my name is Colm Canelli, and I'll, I'll be taking you through the JEDOC software demonstration for the next half an hour or so. Um, yeah, so I, I've got a fairly similar kind of background to, to Kurt. I've been in the industry since about 1996, uh, having worked for similar types of organizations, the likes of uh, uh, Oracle, Hyperion, uh, and IBM. And I've been with JEDOC for, for 10 months now. And uh, it's it's a very exciting place to be. Um, the the technology and the company I think are are, are really interesting, uh, and that's what I, I want to show you in this in this brief session. So let's look at how Jedox kind of overcomes this Excel chaos that uh, Kurt was talking about, and uh, allow you to to plan confidently. So what you can see on the screen at the moment is uh, the Jedox web interface, and I'll, I'll spend a fair bit of time in here. Uh, depending on how we go time-wise, I want to show you um, some of the, the Excel integration capabilities, although we've been, we've been kind of dissing Excel a bit. Um, I, I do want to talk about how it may have a role to play um, when we look at um, some of the other examples later. Okay, so I guess that the first thing to point out is that um, because Jedox is a single integrated platform, pretty much all of my reports, all of my data, all of my models, they're, they're all available here in, uh, in, in one place. So whether I'm planning for the balance sheet or the profit and loss, cash flow, whether I want to model some cost and revenue allocations or do a financial consolidation, uh, all of these kind of components are available for me for me to access from this uh, this single interface. Um, within my profit and loss, we can see that there are potentially further components. So, you know, these might represent uh, different functions or different processes, which are required in this organisation to kind of help me build up the the full picture of the um, of the financial statements. Uh, another way to kind of visualize this and, and think about it is if I show you our, our driver tree example. So uh, a, a fully implemented Jedox environment would, would look, I guess, not, not exactly like this, but probably something like this, whereby uh, over on the right hand side, you've got a set of outputs which are used to uh, make decisions, manage the business, guide the business. Uh, such as the balance sheet, P&L, etc. But all of that information is is coming through from uh, sub models, uh, different models that we're, we, we've put together. Um, and actually, one of the things which we may have mentioned, I'm not sure, Kurt, did you mention the marketplace? Um, the Jedox provides some pre-built models for a lot of these functions and processes uh, to help kind of kickstart implementations. So if you wanted to kickstart a financial consolidation process, for example, we have a pre-built model for that. So it'll help you do it a lot more quickly and you ca can um, take advantage of some of the best practice that uh, that Jedox has learned and that our, our you know, your peer companies ha have learned through that cycle. Okay, so let's look uh, let's look at the software in a bit more detail now. Let's talk about the different ways that it can, it can help me uh, get rid of the Excel chaos and, and plan more confidently. So I'm going to begin by just kind of touching on a few examples of um, of forecasting and how Jados can help us. Uh, there's a few different um, there's some areas of functionality here which I think are, are, are really beneficial and really strong for forecasting. Um, one of the things which I'm not going to show, but it's definitely worth calling out in, in terms of getting data and structures both into and out of Jedox, it's, it's got a very powerful built-in integration tool like a, an ETL, Extract, Transform and Load tool, which is great at getting our, you know, getting our actuals for comparative and reporting purposes, um, and then maybe sending data back to other systems for further analysis and reporting. Uh, and once we've got those actuals and we want to start doing forecasting, Jedox kind of helps us in, in lots of different ways. Um, it's got functionality to create automatic rolling forecasts. It's got functionality to allow us to, to blend versions easily. So if I want to combine my latest forecast with my 
um, with the original budget and start tweaking that. It's very easy kind of to do that via a, a drop down and then see what the impact would be on the number that I'm trying to forecast, which in this example is, is gross revenue. So some very strong capabilities on the integration side as well as on the, um, the forecasting side. And we can get a little bit more um, sophisticated than that because, um, you know, the companies I speak to at the moment, the one topic which is coming up kind of pretty much the whole time is doing predictive forecasts. You know, companies are looking to uh, adopt machine learning um, data science techniques and incorporate those into their kind of um, financial planning processes. Um, and those capabilities are actually included directly within within the Jedox platform. It's not another uh, software product that you have to buy. It's capabilities that, that we provide and we give you sample data and reports and wizards to kind of to help you get started. Uh, and the idea behind it is that, um, you know, a lot of organizations will they'll look at their data and they will maybe say, well, you know, for this type of data, we want to apply, I don't know, linear regression or maybe exponential smoothing is better because exponential smoothing gives a greater weight to more recent values. Um, and when we're setting up these scenarios with the Jedox wizard, we, we can actually tell it what we want it to do. Do we want it to use exponential smoothing or we can actually say, Jedox, go and evaluate the data for me and tell me which of the algorithms is, is the most accurate. And that's what we've done here. So we've used Jedox to create our initial prediction. We can see what the uh, the confidence interval intervals are, the, the upper bounds and the lower bounds. And it's telling us of the methodologies that were evaluated, exponential smoothing is uh, the most accurate. So yeah, so we can kind of seamlessly, seamlessly integrate um, machine learning data science capabilities into, into a Jedox platform. So that's quite a quite an exciting and interesting um, topic area. We can also seamlessly integrate with other processes, such as you know we might have a, a more high high level, longer term strategic plan that we want to do. Uh, we may want you know before we start a, a budgeting or a rolling forecast cycle, we might want to uh, do some top down planning. Uh, set some targets, um, set some objectives, challenge the business to to do better than, than previous periods, uh, you know, or kind of get a better handle on costs. And again, all of the, all those capabilities are, are are fully integrated. So what we might want to do as a starting point, then maybe it might make sense to to see that with uh, the most recent forecast, which was just populated in in the previous step. And we could do that pretty much at any level in our organizational hierarchy. And we can see those numbers kind of cascading down into the different parts of the business uh, where we're operating. Um, but, you know, realistically, we probably don't want to just kind of sit on our hands and do the same as what we're projected to do. We might want to uh, be a bit more ambitious. We might have issues in specific markets, so we don't expect any growth in one particular area. So if we do want to find some growth somewhere, then that's going to have to be found in other parts of the business. Uh, so Jedox allows for that kind of multi-level uh, selecting and cascading and, and holding different items to be uh, removed from the, the impact, impact of changes. Okay, so again, it's all integrated. Our, you know, our forecasting, our target setting, um, our budget process, all managed in, in one place. Now, so coming back to the, the theme of the event is about uh, eliminating um, spreadsheet chaos. And I think one of the ways where we, we really kind of can eliminate a lot of the chaos is um, by using some of the tools that allow us to, to manage uh, planning workflow and approvals. So I'm just going to kick off the, the annual kind of sales budget process. And just while that's running, um, you can see that Jedox makes it really easy to uh, start a workflow cycle, inform all the users that need to input that uh, uh, the system is open, we're expecting their input. Uh, and really what we're trying to do here is just eliminate those uh, manual steps of having to create multiple emails with individual files attached and sending those out to tens or hundreds of users and, and having no visibility into, um, into where we are in a planning cycle. Um, so Jedex really kind of completely automates that entire process. 
and it can do it for any number of processes as well so we may have not just an annual budget we might have monthly forecast cycles we might have we might want to collect some uh, kpis or actual data we may have a consolidation cycle so really you know this is one of the key ways that we eliminate uh, all of that uh, that spreadsheet chaos and you may have noticed that uh, while i was kind of talking that i received an email from from jedox saying that the sales budget has been started um, please log on and complete the tasks that uh, that are assigned to you so again let's have a quick look at what the user will see and how you know we're, we're getting away from the spreadsheet chaos and, and giving them uh, secure reliable efficient access uh, to their data with um, you know lots of functionality to really kind of help them plan in a much more kind of meaningful and, and agile way so they can log on securely and that ensures they're working with uh, the latest data they're working with the latest definition of the model in terms of any rules and calculations and, and business logic um, and, and it's a multi-dimensional view as well so you know I, I may be required to do planning across lots of customers not just one and again I can pick and choose those I can slice and dice the view to work with a particular customer no more working through individual spreadsheet files and worksheets across uh, lots of different files so I can choose the customers that I want to work with um, this example we've deliberately not kind of filled in any of the numbers it's kind of a, very much a zero based methodology but if the user wanted to fill in let's say I'm going to use the latest actuals as a starting point and then uh, I'm gonna uplift that by, by 10% or whatever. So again, we can make the interface and we can make the whole kind of user experience really simple and intuitive um, for how they think about their, um, their planning numbers uh, and how they can actually do their input without having to go through every single month, every single product, every single um, measure item on there. Um, yeah, so again, we can make those commands very intuitive. I can pick up the, the values I want to use. Maybe I want to use the target numbers plus 10%. If there are specific commands I want to apply that aren't kind of neatly covered by the, the ones that we've kind of provided out of the box, I can use what we call the planning assistant and start to do kind of more sophisticated kind of planning options, um, splashing numbers across uh, multiple levels in the hierarchy, setting values to base cells, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of flexibility for the user. Okay, so again, we're, we're trying to get rid of um, spreadsheet chaos. We're trying to eliminate the kind of the scenario whereby a user changes the spreadsheet that they've received and when we get it back into the center it isn't going to aggregate properly because they, they've messed up the uh, the structure they've messed up a formula and Jedox takes care of that so we can give them you know we, they can view their data in different ways for example it might make sense to look at the the budget numbers that they're submitting versus the the target that was assigned to them to see how they are they actually tracking uh, above or below that target and then one of the final things to show in this particular example, but I think this really shows, again, one of the, uh, the key ways of eliminating spreadsheet chaos is when we look at the, the workflow controls. So this is kind of my area, this is my prompt to really sign off on my submission, um, add some narrative and commentary just to say that I'm done uh, and also kind of move it on to the next kind of review stage so that my manager or someone in the um, financial control department wants to see where we are then my data is immediately available to them there's a full history there's a full kind of audit trail of the the workflow and review process as i've been going through and and updating and changing my numbers and an email is generated to tell me that um, and I think one really important thing, you'll see that once I have submitted the, the, the numbers which were gray, I could update, I can no longer update them because I've locked my submission. And this is one of the ways that we ensure uh, data integrity, data consistency, no more, you know, no more argu you know, arguments over whose numbers are correct because we, we, we've already got that. And, you know, from a financial controlling perspective if i'm back in the center 
and I need to to run the profit and loss report again, then as you would expect, when I go to that report, then I get the the the, the latest up-to-date information from my users uh, immediately coming through. So again, saving a lot of time and a lot of spreadsheets um, chaos. And I think what, what's interesting about this is that, um, you know, in real life, of course, planning is never just about one department or or one function working in, in isolation, because typically the decisions of one department will impact um, on the decisions of others. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to fill in some numbers for that because uh, it's going to make the, the next sequence a bit more meaningful if I have some realistic data in here. But let's say, you know, this is like a like an Apple ad. Some of the sequences have been shortened um, because we want, uh, you know, a, a fuller view of our sales numbers so that when we go and look at our production planning process, we can see what decisions we need to make based on what we're hoping to hoping to sell in the coming year. And yeah, so let's imagine we've collected all of that data. It gives us a meaningful view of um, our kind of supply and demand. And then, well, based on the sales plan, if I go and look at my production lines, then we can see immediately that we have some utilization problems. So based on what the organization is hoping to do, We've got problems in kind of four of our lines, so we can actually, uh, you know, with current kind of assumptions and constraints, we can actually meet that demand. And what I want to do, I just want to spend a few minutes kind of um, drilling into that just to show you how Jedox can help us fix some of these problems. So I'm going to look at assembly line four, which based on the current planning information is looking at a very, very high utilization number. So I want to see what um, options, what controls are available for me to go and try and fix some of these issues. And we can see that the issue isn't just the, the full year number. We've pretty much got problems across all 12 periods that we're, we're planning for. OK. So what are some of the levers that I can kind of pull to kind of fix some of these problems? And the, the, the first one is I, I could allocate some data to one of my assembly lines, which has got some free capacity. So this takes me into uh, a screen which allows me to look at you know, similar lines which are, are capable of producing the products that we're, we're making um, on this assembly line. Um, which is number four, and I think I'm going to shift 29,000 units from assembly line four to assembly line seven. Okay, so that's looking quite good. So for my overall number for the year, I'm well below the utilization actually on both of my uh, both of my assembly lines. So let me just close that down and come back and look at the the monthly view. So I fixed quite a number of the months there, but not all of them. So there's a couple of other decision points that I can take, things I might want to do. So if we're selling a lot more in period six and we've got free capacity in uh, period one, then maybe I can transfer 200 to period 2022-01. If I shift that across, then that's fine because period one still has capacity. And period seven, we've now gone, we've now gone green. Uh, additionally, so those are that's another lever that I can pull. Um, haven't quite fixed all of the months. We still got some problems later in the year, uh, and clearly our capacity is very much driver based. So in terms of the total net operating hours metric that we have available, there's a number of drivers that get to that, and that would include things like days per month, which you know, I don't really have any control over the number of days in the month. Um, I probably don't want to be increasing the hours per shift from eight because that's going to upset my staff and it's probably going to break some local labor laws. But I can indeed change the number of shifts per day, you know, from two to three, for example, and that should kind of fix my problem. OK, so, yeah, so that's looking good. Problem solved by using different capabilities, different methodologies that Jedox makes available to us by either reallocating production across lines or reallocating across periods or changing some of the, the underlying uh, drivers behind those numbers. 
Uh, and of course, another way to do that would have been to create a new line. So if it was possible to create, you know, let's say a new line in um, in London or somewhere, we could add that line in. We could tell Jedox that that line is going to be an assembly line, which is where we're having the issues. And then in terms of kind of initializing that line, you know, what what are the parameters of that particular line? What, what's it like in terms of its production? It's going to be similar to assembly line six that can be initiated as part of the, the planning process. And you'll see when I come back here, there's now a new line available for me to start allocating some of the uh, the extra demand that we're seeing in you know assembly line one, five, six, et cetera. Why is that important? Well, you know, in terms of what I've just done, I've, I've made a structural change to the model because we needed to, to make a key change to enable us to um, start planning and reallocating capacity. But I was able to do it mid-cycle. So while I'm actually doing the planning entry, I can affect that change. I don't have to kick people out of the system. I don't have to go to uh, Excel and do a file save as from another assembly line and change some of the parameters and then try and get it to add up somehow into the all the dependent spreadsheets. I've made that change very quickly, very simply using the um, uh, the Jedox web interface. Okay, so that was a kind of a, a quick tour of how Jedox can help you overcome Excel chaos and allow you to plan more confidently. And there's there's lots of there's lots of capabilities to um, talk about. What I did want to show is I want to change direction very, very slightly. And I just want to talk about um, another kind of uh, example of um, <clears throat> of Jedox capabilities and how it can help you um, how it can help you build planning models actually utilizing Excel. So I'm going to come back to that one, actually, but I'm, I'm going to start with uh, with this one. So very often, you know, in, in my role as a solution advisory consultant, very often people send me kind of their spreadsheets of their data and they send me they send me examples of the kind of reports that they're they're looking to looking to produce and looking to get away from, really looking to to automate and just make those reports just more repeatable so they can do it. Um, more often, you know, they can do it every week or every month. Uh, more repeatable in terms of doing new planning versions and new forecasting scenarios, etc. Uh, and just really automating the whole process and getting away from the Excel chaos. So although we have been kind of, like I say, dissing Excel a little bit, uh, Jedox does have very good integration to allow us to, to read our data in Excel from a Jedox database and also to write back if we want to do planning and, um, and, and forecasting. The other thing it can allow us to do is this concept that we call data-driven modeling. And this is a really powerful capability that will allow you to, you know, it'll look at your Excel data. So Jedox will look at what, what it sees in Excel and it'll allow you to interpret this as a Jedox database. Now again, some of the sequences have been shorted, like, like shortened, like an Apple ad. Um, but we we've kind of told Jedox, you know, what the time dimension is from the source file. We've told it we're going to have a hierarchy representing the organization, and we're going to have um, a kind of a cost reporting structure, which is another. It's like um, a general ledger account dimension, uh, as well as some values. Uh, and from here, we can also say, well, I want you to create a version dimension because typically when we're doing this, we want to identify some data which is actual versus the other data which is going to be budget forecast and, and just kind of logically separate that out. Um, so yeah, so everything is actually in place for me to, to build that model. Um, and then I can hit the button, Jedox will kind of read my data in, It'll build the relevant dimensions. It'll build a data cube for me, and also populate that cube with the data from from the Excel file. Okay, so a really good way to visualize how that looks is if I open up a a blank uh, workbook in in Excel, and I go to my my Jedox menu, and I want to create a new view of the database that I created a second ago which it called the database Excel to web. The cube's got the same name and it's created these dimensions. So I want to look at my cost elements in the rows. 
I'd like to see my time dimension in the columns and the other three dimensions, I'm going to move those into what we call the point of view. And so from there, I can move between actual and budget. And at the moment, I'm only going to have actual data, pasting that um, into Excel. And then I can drill up and down on the, the model that Jedox created for me behind the scenes. So it's created this time dimension with several years worth of data, several months rolling up into quarters. And each of these account lines will represent uh, a level of detail from the, from the GL. Um, so how can we be confident in these numbers? If somebody were to look at these numbers in Jedox and say, well, okay, I, I see you've got a value there of 38,000. How is that number made up? And to give us confidence in those numbers, I can drill through to the Jedox database and it, it will actually show me the, the transactions behind the scenes that we loaded in to make up that number. So if anybody has a question about how our numbers arrived at, then the drill through capability in Jedox answers that question pretty much um, immediately. Um, so that's the first thing that it does. So it creates that model and it makes it very easy to slice and dice uh, the data and drill through and drill down and all that kind of good stuff. Um, it does allow us as well, if we're interested in, let's say, moving into doing some planning or forecasting, I can toggle the versions and get that to look at, let's say, budget data which of course there's no data there at the moment because I just created the model from actuals. And now maybe I want to, for my budget data, I want to copy the actual for 2020. I literally type that in and then it, go, it, it reads that command and then reads the data from the actuals. And then if I want to start using some of those kind of useful planning assistant capabilities that I showed you a moment ago, I can highlight the relevant cell. Let's say we don't expect any um, we don't expect any increase in our other personnel costs, but I do expect costs to go up to 13 million for that particular that particular version, and that number will then get cascaded down pro rata across uh, all the other um, cost centers and all the account lines, making up my my cost elements. Um, and having created that basic model from Excel, the, the model itself probably doesn't necessarily have everything that I might want when I come to creating um, uh, different views of the data. I can actually transition directly from the Excel interface into the modeling interface and then enhance my database very easily. So the Excel to web database, as you've seen, was made up of cost elements, entities, measures, time, versions, etc. You know, maybe one way we want to enhance the model is by um, allowing users to add commentary. So that's easily added. Um, if we look at our time dimension, it, it is a time dimension and Jedox uh, treats it as a time dimension and it allows us to give it special properties. What do I mean by that? So let's look at the time editor. Uh, and typically, one big challenge with um, doing financial reporting and monthly reporting is being able to move between um, the view of the values for the period as well as the view of the values year to date. Because doing that in Excel typically requires an awful lot of Excel formulas to be uh, created, maintained, updated, etc. But actually, Jedox will automatically create year to date for us. So if we, if we want to run a report, um, it's already calculated in the database for us and we just we just retrieve that value uh, in the reporting interface. The other thing which is really powerful is if we start moving into uh, rolling forecasts, so we may have a, a 12 or an 18 or a 24 month cycle, and we want those kind of groupings of each of our 12 months forecasts created automatically, well, guess what? Jedos can do that too, simply by typing in 12 and telling it to, to update to dimension. Okay, so the time editor is really important, you know, in terms of getting rid of Excel chaos, you know, there's some simple things you can do in the Jedox database uh, to really automate a lot of the things which are kind of difficult um, and error prone at the moment. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna do here is just to show you how easy it is to, to add new versions in. If I want to add maybe a forecast throughout the year, I can add that into the model very, very quickly and easily. 
Okay, now there was a point to doing a lot of that, by the way, and the point about it is if I come back to my my source file that I spoke about, and as I say, what we're looking to do here is we're looking to um, kind of get rid of some of these, let me just close this down, sorry. We're looking to get rid of manual Excel files that are kicking around that we're using to create reports. Uh, either we've just dumped the data in from the general ledger or we're using VLOOKUPs that kind of further sheets behind the scenes. How can we take advantage of all the work we've done making our Excel reports look nice but be able to use those and share those widely in a secure way with, the, with, a, with a wider user community. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this particular, um, this tab, this report file, and I'm gonna move it into a new book so that I've just got it on its own and create a copy. So that report is now kind of, it's still linking back by a VLOOKUP, but I wanna get rid of that. I don't wanna be getting data from Excel. I wanna be getting it from, from Jedox. Um, so I'm going to, the last thing I'm going to show you here is a little bit of Jedox magic. So we can, we can highlight the data that we want to be coming from, from the Jedox database, such as, you know, our actuals, our budgets, our forecasts, etc. All of this data we want coming through dynamically from Jedox, not, not from Excel. So if I highlight the cells I'm interested in, all I need to do is to use this really powerful capability called paste data function. And that paste data function will allow me to go to the database I just created and allow me to guess the arguments. So I want you to look at my Excel file and if you find corresponding things in the Jedox database, then I want you to kind of uh, fill in the formula for me. So if I paste that and then it's finished. I can now see that my number is no longer coming via VLOOKUPs. It's coming directly from the Jedox database. Uh, and to kind of round this off a little bit, at the moment, this report has been hard coded for one department. I don't want to do that. I want to make this dynamic. So similarly, I can paste elements and say, instead of selecting that here, let's select it from Jedox. So let me select the administration department from, from Jedox. So now we can run the same report for you know, any other department. I can run it for services and I get a dynamic query on the numbers. So that's one of the really key ways that we can eliminate spreadsheet chaos. Uh, we can take what you've already done, all that time you spent on your nice looking reports doesn't get thrown away, but then we use Jedox to, to give us the numbers securely, confidently and reliably. Hold on, can uh, you have a story where you were working on a project with the client because I know I had this and you said you you did it even better to where you actually built the database and then connected the customer's Excel sheet to that database. You want to tell me just briefly say what you did? Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so a, a particular customer, um, they wanted me to reproduce a report that they had in Excel. So they sent me some you know, something like this in an email. And uh, we'd already built the database because we knew what particular dimensions they were trying to capture, what versions they were trying to capture, et cetera. And I said to the guy, I said, the database is fine, but how is the information gonna look to the user? And he said, well, this is the Excel file that we produce. And I literally did a save as from the email attachments, opened up his spreadsheet and did exactly what I just showed you there, the, the paste data function. So, you know, this is clearly not their data. I'm not going to share a real customer's data or their report format, but um, you know th this is real. We can create reports. We can recreate those Excel reports in uh, you know in, in a much more kind of repeatable, consistent way, and, uh, and we do that exactly using the capabilities which you've seen you've seen in this demonstration. The paste data function to guess arguments and the paste elements to pick up the right elements that we want to do we want to do in reporting. Okay. So, like I say, we 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 we're, we dis Excel and we we will continue to dis Excel, but um, we can use it to our advantage when we use it properly. But we also embrace Excel too. I mean, yeah, we do indeed. Yeah. You use Excel for what Excel is good at. Use it as for reporting. But Excel was never built to be a database or a calculation engine or workflow. All of those things that you showed today 
that's not what Excel was built for. So use Excel where Excel is the correct tool, and that is the end user, yeah? but yeah. not for all of the backend data calculations. So with that, Colm, we had a lot of questions come in, and I do want to get to them, okay? okay. I'm going to breathe through the last slide that I had, and then we'll get into some of the questions, okay? Okay, so once again, uh, audience, the, the, what we want to show is a path, yeah, the maturity path, going from where you see the automate on the left, and then you get to go through then the different stages. So what Colin was showing at the beginning, and you know, obviously with the AI and the data-driven uh, or the, the driver-based planning, a lot of that is more advanced, and you're not going to do that in the first weeks of your project. But that is where you want to get to because that is where then uh, the value is going to be. I'm going to just jump over this super fast. You know, these are results that, as you see, it says it comes from our success outcome results. And this is what I want to talk about very briefly. We have structured what we call the success, the success outcome process. Every project needs to have a an ROI on it needs to have what are what is you know what is the value of this project so we actually have a system we would be more than happy to walk you through that and that's why we're going to do a poll question in just uh, a few seconds if you want us to be in contact with you if you want to receive newsletters if you want to receive information about future uh, webinars like this we would need to have your consent obviously because of GDPR and one of the things that we offer, should you want to uh, do the exercise with us, is that we will go through our value creation model with you. It's based on your information so that you get to see what would the results be if we were to embark on an EPM project. So can we put that poll question up really quickly? Um, and then we'll get into the um, questions. Sure. So I've just put the um, poll question up. So if you could just select yes or no, and then I'll close that poll question. Okay. And this just gives the consent that we would be able to uh, send you further information should you so desire. Okay. So on a few of these questions, I'm going to start off with one that came in early. I think it was from a statement that I made. I, I would have liked to have actually had a poll after this session um, is and to ask uh, of the companies that are here, how many of you did a budgeting process where you were just basically applying a percentage change to both revenue and cost, or were you using a different process? You know, I, I said, Prior to 2020, people said, okay, it'd be 5% up on revenue, 3% on cost, you know, more or less. My question is, so has it really changed? I, I think companies are still doing it that way. They're just not certain about where they're going to land anymore. But I would have liked to have done a poll on that. Um, I don't know, Colm, what do you think? Do you think, do you think companies have moved on and are, are, are embracing things like beyond budgeting more and zero-based budgeting? Or are they still just applying, hey, we, we want to grow 20%. Guys below, make it happen. I, two things. I think the beyond budgeting, seeing a lot more of that, seeing people talking about, you know, no annual budget, just a rolling forecast. And, you know, uh, just doing that all the time, never doing an annual budget anymore. Uh, and of course, the AI side. You know, people are definitely, you know, every meeting I've had in the last two months, it's come up. Mm -hmm. People are people yeah. are really interested in, you know, how can we apply uh, machine learning data science to our data to give us um, more accurate forecasts? And, you know, I think people are looking to do that. They're not looking to necessarily replace forecasting, the human forecasting. They're looking to augment it, supplement it and say, well, this is what the algorithm says. This is what you think. Here's the difference. What do we do about that difference? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, where do companies tend to see the value from implementing planning software 
and how quickly is this use usually realized? So that kind of goes back to the last slide that I showed where we have our uh, success outcome uh, process. One of the things that we want to do is that before we do a project, we already want to start to define what are the success criteria for you and what is going to be the return on this project because we measure ourselves against those results because we also want to see the value that we are creating for the, uh, our customers that embark with us. Um, in general, where do companies see it? I, I mean, Colm, I'll, I'll answer first and you can go back. It, it comes back that the guy who studied computer science, it's about reliability, efficiency, and security. Um, to have a system to work, that's reliable and you're not sending around massive Excel sheets and then you get the result that says consolidation, you know, error in consolidation. It's not a reliable system, it's not secure. And, and any EPM system will at least bridge that point. How do you see Colm? Yeah, I think the other aspect which is, is relevant, uh, I think, again, everybody wants to do more scenarios. Right. People have always wanted to do scenario modeling, scenario analysis. That's been around, you know, as long as you and I've been working in this industry, Kurt. But I think with uh, with COVID, it really hit home, you know, because obviously if, if you've done a plan in January, then it was out of date by the beginning of March. So, you know, it, it was just a, a level of volatility and a shock to every organization had to make changes. It was just, you know, I, I, you know hopefully we'll never see anything on that scale again. But you know, it really drove the need for you know better scenario modeling, doing it more often, and doing um, doing it differently than before. Uh, which, like I say, has always been a requirement. But COVID really brought it home. And I think again, like you said, with um, the war in Ukraine, you know, if your if your outcomes are linked to you know exports or the link to the oil price or any of that stuff, then you know you need to Gas know energy. how that could look. I have a question here with uh, a, a few question marks behind it. I think it's based on the comment that I said about uh, Excel not being a calculation engine. Uh, so the, the question is, Excel is not a calculation engine? Absolutely, Excel is a calculation engine. You can build whatever you want in, in Excel and calculate however much you want. Colm, how about talk about, do you do centralized calculations or do you have decentralized calculations? How do you see that? You're asking me from a Jedox point of view, or yeah, I mean, how would you answer that? Is Excel a calculate or you know, Excel a calculation engine versus how how does Excel do the calculations versus how do you do them in Jedox or any EPM tool for okay, really right. matter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think that that's probably the big difference. So that if you got to write a you know something as simple as a, a gross profit formula in Jedox, you write it once. You don't have to write it times 12, times every cost center, times every version, times every product or whatever that is. You write it once and you maintain it once. So yeah, that's where there's a, clearly a big difference. Yeah, because it's based in a database and not in a spreadsheet yeah. anymore. And that means also that if you have errors in a formula, you're only going like in an EPM product like Jedox, you would only have it one time. And then you fix it and then it's fixed for all of the input sheets because it's centralized calculation rather than having the front end Excel doing the calculations. So you centralize the logic, which again goes back to the three principles of making it more efficient, more secure. So, all right. Uh, oh, here's a good one that just came in. Can Jedox be used with Power BI reporting? Come on. I'll let you yep. tee that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um I had a, a meeting this morning where I showed Power BI integration with Jedox, and I had a meeting yesterday where I showed Power BI integration with Jedox. I also showed integration with Click and SAP. Yeah. And those are just a couple that we integrate to. There's a there's a whole list of things that we that we integrate with. And uh, but but I think the key point is natively, you know, we we we've got native certified connectors for Power BI, Click, Tableau, Salesforce, SAP, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So, you know, again, that, that, that can often be a big, big stumbling block in, in, in these projects. How am I going to get the data into my existing BI environment? You know, I think we've got a very strong story on that with our, with our integrator capabilities. Yeah. We've done an incredible amount of work with Microsoft over the last years when it comes to the integration, not only just with Power BI, 
to where actually you have your your Power BI screen, and then there's a a table in there, and people are like, oh, when did Power BI start to do planning? Well, actually, that's a Jedox widget, which is integrated within Power BI. Um, but with Power BI, with Dynamics 365, obviously you saw our integration with the uh, Microsoft Office platform. And one of the big reasons why we've really been doing this push with Microsoft is that they're also one of our biggest customers. So Microsoft uses Jedox worldwide for its uh, sales uh, and revenue planning. So uh, with that, I do see that we are actually over time. We didn't get through all the questions. We will follow up with those questions. There's some fantastic questions in there. Thank you very much for asking them. Um, yes, and with that, we do hope this was informative for you. I understand that this uh, session was a little bit different from the ones we've done in the past, where it has been purely just dot leadership. On this one, yes, we are showing uh, uh, product with it to show how this can be done, okay? Thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for uh, being part of the SEMA community. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you, and Colm, thank you for your presentation. It's always thank enjoyable. You, and thanks everybody for your time. Thank you.